All right, I'm going to show you how to do a maniple and stole uh, for uh, any kind of vestment, really. This particular one I have is the, the appliques are printed on the fabric. This is one I'm selling on Etsy now. I just put up. You don't need a pattern for it. You just have to cut everything out on the lines and sew it together. And I'm doing this mostly for the people who buy that fabric to show them how to put it together. But you can apply it to any other kind of stolen maniple. If you want, you, you need to cut the lining about an inch wider than the fabric. If you plan to do it the same way as the chasuble has done, that is turn the lining to the front and cover it with trim. But I'm not doing it with this particular one. I'm going to do right sides together, turn inside out which is usually the way I, I do all um, stoles and maniples and chalice veils. Uh, but this one is velvet and I had considered doing that. So I did cut it out, the lining out that way, but later cut it down. You need to find the center of the maniple because, and the stole, but for here I'm doing the maniple because you need to put a cross there. You can either embroider it, which is what I do, or you can cut across uh, you can buy a cross and sew it down in that spot. I sell crosses. Other people sell them as well. Uh, in which case you would just sew over the, the cross in place. That one was on water soluble stabilizer which can be dissolved and then you just have the cross. The stole has to be sewn together to get uh, before you can put the cross on it because of the curve at the neck. So both the lining and the main fabric have to be sewn together. There's about a half an inch seam allowance at the end. And once that's, once you sew across that, all you have to do then is, um, so open the, open the seam up and press it flat. The easiest way to press a seam flat is to press it all in one direction, the whole seam, one direction, and then press it all the way in the other direction. That puts a good crease on each side, so you won't get any little puckers in it. And then once you have pressed it in both directions, you open up the center and press it flat. And you'll find it's much easier to get it flat by doing it this way. Now the, the lining doesn't need the cross, so I'll just put that aside. And uh, I s open up and press this, the, uh, the stole seam open. I broke a needle when I sewed this across and I just found that the tip of the needle, sewing machine needle is still in the fabric. So I have to get that out. It's stuck in the threads. And now I can, now I can press it open. Again, I'll do it the same way. I'll press the whole seam one direction and then the other direction. Velvet's a little bit thicker than the lining, so it won't want to lay open as easily as the lining did. But as I say, this is low nap velvet and it's not as thick as most velvets. Now I'm going to put the cross right on that seam on the back. So I'll go and embroider both of those pieces. This is what it looks like with the embroidery in the center of the maniple. And this is the center of the stole. It just needs a small cross. And that's a cross stitch. I sell that in Etsy too. If you have a machine, embroidery machine, you can uh, just use it to sew these things down. Now I'm putting right sides together 
and I'm going to pin the the two face pieces of fabric all the way along both sides. I I don't sew the ends of either stole or maniple closed. I'll, you'll see how I close those later. Makes it easier to turn if you don't sew them. Now because this is velvet, it will have a tendency to move in the direction of the nap. Um, so sometimes, even though everything's lined up on both sides here, once it's finished sewing, it could be a little bit, uh, you could find a little bit of fabric sticking out one side or the other. Uh, what I'm showing you now is the direction to sew. You want to sew from one end all the way to the other and then go back to the end you started and sew the other one the same way. Don't stop, turn around and go back. Sew both sides the same direction. When you're sewing anything very long like that, the feed dogs tend to move your fabric. So if you sewed very, all the way down one side and then turned and came back the other side in the other direction, you would find it would um, pull to wonder in one direction as you came back and pull the other direction you you would you'd get almost like diagonal creases across it. The stole you want to start with the center matching up the two again right sides together matching up the two um, seams and you want to work all the way down in one direction and then come back and work all the way in the other direction. Um, getting both your sides together. When I sewed this, I didn't find that the maniple shifted much, but the stole really did. Uh, it'll always shift the about the 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 width. Wouldn't say the width, the height of the nap. This is this nap is very low, so it doesn't shift that much. In, in in one direction or the other. But I, I've I, with deep pile velvet that's like an eighth of an inch thick, your whole thing is gonna shift an eighth of an inch in, in one direction, a direction you don't want it to go. And in that case, that's why a lot of times with velvet, I usually um, cut the lining and do the lining for even the small pieces like the stole and the maniple. I do them the same way as I do the chasuble. That is, um, put seam allowance on the lining and wrap it around to the front and cover that edge with trim. That way it can't, it can't shift. But as I say, this is very low nap and I didn't have much problem with it. So I decided to do it the way I usually do with most fabrics that are not velvet and do right sides together, turn inside out. I could cut out all this here watching me put pins in, but there are, I know there's a lot of people who actually want to see the whole thing and that they feel that if I leave something out that I've, I've skipped something that, and they need it. So you can just fast forward through this if you don't want to see me putting all the pins in. Now I've gone back to the center and I'm going to line up the other side.
you haven't done so, you might want to look at my... Um, I have a couple of websites. I have an Etsy website where I sell appliques, patterns, uh, digital designs for embroidery, for, uh, for vestments, vestment embroidery designs in digital format. If you have a machine, uh, um, a machine embroid an embroidery machine. Um, I also have other, I have, I also have some complete investments for sale up there and other, some other things too. Then, then, then there's another vet website, uh, so vestments, S E W hyphen V E S T M E N T S dot com. And that's where I put, um, general information on vestment making where it links for fabrics, links for trims, links for, um, well, links to my videos. There's a gallery of some of the vestments that I've made and I'm willing to put up vestments that other people my, and my students have made. Um, I used to have them in another gallery, but I've lost that website. So um, I'll have to start over from scratch with some of theirs. I also post the seminar information there when I'm having seminars. This summer I, I posted the seminar schedule, but then I had to cancel it because of COVID. Um, and I've also started a, now what I'm showing you here is the direction to sew. You're going to start at the center seam and sew all the way to the bottom. Then you're going to go back to the center seam and sew all the way down the other side. Then you're going to go back to the center seam again and sew all the way down in the other direction. Each time you're coming back to the center seam and then back to the center seam and the other side. Again, you can't go all the way down to the bottom, turn around and come back. You have to go from the center seam down. It's just too long. And now that it's sewn now, um, we'll take all the pins out and then turn it right side out. As I was saying, I had to cancel the seminars this summer, uh, but since I'm retired now, I will probably, and I don't have to, um, my problem with seminars in Syracuse was that, first of all, winter times are very, very bad times for traveling. Uh, nobody really wants to come to Syracuse in the winter time. I'm, what I'm cutting off is the extra fabric that where, as I said, it's shifted a little bit, not much, hardly, Hardly an eighth of an inch. Um, but anyway, nobody likes to come to Syracuse in the wintertime. So I, and also because I teach, uh, or I was teaching then, and I had girls living, boarding with me during the school year, I could not have seminars during the school year. I could only have them during the summertime when the girls were gone so that I had the use of their bedrooms to put people up who came for seminars. Uh, what I have, now that I'm retired, and I don't have to worry about that. And we have a, a guest house. It's really a mobile home, but it's nice. And that's where I'm going to be having the seminars, and people who come for seminars can stay there. Um, but I, down here, I can do the seminars any time during the, the year. I'm not limited to only the summertime. And so I may be doing wintertime seminars down here because... I know people in other parts of the country would like to get away during the wintertime, and it's really much more comfortable to do a seminar down here during the wintertime than in the hot humidity of the summer. So I will probably be doing seminars in all four seasons, but not... Um, but I can do them in all four seasons, which I couldn't do in New York. Um... But because I had to cancel the summers, the seminars, and they'll remain canceled until this COVID thing is over with, um, and that was that was pretty much my income. Uh, so I put up a Patreon, a patron. I think it's called Patreon, or it's a it's for patrons. It, in other words, if you want to support me or the work that I do, you can subscribe to. 
a membership there and they ch the memberships are any level from a dollar up and um and people who sign up on some of the upper levels they get extra perks that lower level people don't get such as uh free materials um class dvds the classes on dvds uh books um access to other videos that i don't put on youtube um even at the use of the guest house for a weekend if you're ever coming down to new orleans and or baton rouge and need a place to stay yeah but anyway Uh, oh, I'm showing you here that you have to clip the, um, clip the curves so that when you turn it, um, it will, it will lay right. So you have to clip the outside curves and the inside curves. I'll put links in the description to all my my four websites. Well, this is one. Etsy, uh, oh, actually there is four besides YouTube. There is uh, the Patreon, the Sew Vestments, the Etsy, and um, the school website, which is where the classes, if you want the, if you want the whole complete DVD course um, for making a Latin chasuble or making an online Gothic chasuble, you can find it in the, the school class courses. And I'll be putting up albs and copes and dalmatics probably sometime in the future there. Now you have to turn it right side out. And uh, you could reach all the way down inside and I do that usually with the maniple but with the stole being so long and because it's curved I just take it in small sections and pull it out. I'm glad that people enjoy the vestment making seminars, or I mean the videos. Uh, I know I don't have in the millions like some people do or even the thousands, but the fact that there's a, a, a hundred subscribers means that there's a hundred people out there that are interested in making vestments. And that's not usually a hundred people who are different than the ones who also are subscribers to my in quotes newsletter i i don't send out newsletters very often though i think i probably now that i'm retired i probably will more often maybe once a month let you know what videos i put up on youtube what uh, what books or classes are are available on the other websites as well so if you haven't done that go to so Go to Sew Vestments, to the where it says free links and free stuff. Uh, the links are for the fabric and trim, but they're also on that page. You can uh, subscribe to, to the newsletter. Won't cost you anything, and you get some bonus free items like a miter pattern and materials lists and a few other things. Um, I left a pin in this and I'm, what I'm doing is taking the pin out. It's, uh, I use glass head pins and so if a pin gets stuck in there all I have to do is take the pliers and break the head of the pin. It'll pop because it's glass and then I can with the pliers just pull the shank of the pin out without having to poke a, a hole in the fabric.
reason I use glass head pins, if you watch, didn't watch the materials um, video, I use glass head pins because I do I, I iron as I go. I do a lot of ironing and because I use a lot of steam seam or stitch witchery, it has to be put down with um, with a hot iron with steam and gla uh, glass head pins will take will take that heat where other pins that have plastic heads will melt and leave a glop of dirty black plastic residue on your fabric so that's why I use glass head pins so I often iron right on top of the pins and you can't do that if they're plastic and if if they have no head at all then you go to pull them out you'll burn yourself What I did was I filmed this, um, deciding that I was going to come back afterwards and put in narration because I have the embroidery machine running at the same time and it makes a lot of noise in the background and you might not be able to hear me. And also I have the rosary playing because as I work, I listen and say the rosary with it. And so I couldn't do that if I was narrating this out loud. So I just decided, well, I would just go ahead and film it and then come back afterwards and add the audio to it and give you a play by play. Hopefully the audio and the video will match. If you didn't buy this fabric that has the the appliques or already printed on the fabric, and you wanted to put an applique down yourself, buy your own applique down, um, they're used. I usually put them about two inches from the bottom of the stole, two to two and a half inches, whatever looks good, from the bottom of the stole and the maniple. Now what I'm going to do is I got to get this flat. So I have to get the, the um, you want to make sure the seam is all the way out on both sides. And so what I do is I pull it out and then I pin it and I pin it to the table. I just stick the pin into to the fabric that's on the table. And there I got a, a picked up, it looks like a needle, though it could have been a headless pin one that I broke the the head on but I think it was a needle and but anyway what I do is I just um, poke the needle right into the fabric to hold it because I only need to hold it long enough to make sure that I'm going to put it on both sides making sure that the the seam is pulled out and then just hit it with the iron and I'm working on the I'm working on the right side, but then I decided because it's again velvet, I'm going to work on the wrong side so that I can hit it with the iron and I won't leave marks. Uh, with high nap velvet, it will push the nap all the way down, and you it's, you can't. It's very difficult to get it up again. 
This is a low nap velvet and even though it won't leave the marks of the high nap wheel, if your iron and most irons do and because mine is a steam iron it does, has holes in the plate at the bottom, when you press down on the with the plate, if you don't with the iron, those holes that are in the plate will leave a little bit leave the nap a little high at that spot and you can see the marks of the iron where you know where you put the iron down um, of course if you move the iron you that doesn't happen but you're also then pressing down the nap so by doing it from the wrong side I won't have that problem at all and as I say this is a low nap so it's not really that um, much of a problem. If it were high nap, I'd have to use a needle board. Velvet is a difficult fabric to work with. And I did a few videos on the problems that you have with working with velvet. Why well, reason I turned it over there to look was I just wanted to make sure I wasn't getting any marks and I wasn't. So I'm just going to go down both sides like this, um, pulling the seams out so that everything is flat and will lie flat. This doesn't really take that long. But it's an important step. And I do hit it with some steam. And now I get to do the other side. That's one side of the stole. Now I have to go back to the center and go down the other side.
on the Patreon website, I put, I'm doing a set of videos of um, showing the steps that I go through remaking an old vestment. Um, if you ever have the need to repair an old vestment or remake one or um, or just copy one it's it's the steps that I go through and that's for subscribers to the Patreon website Now when I got to this point here, I found that it was, wasn't was sewn all the way down because I'd run out of bobbin thread and didn't notice it. And so about the last three inches are open. So I have to unpin this part of the vestment that I just pinned down and take it back to the sewing machine and sew those three inches. Don't have to turn it right. I don't have to turn it inside out again. It's right at the bottom. I could just fold back that edge a little bit and um, and sew those three inches. It'd be different if it was. I found a spot where I had gone off um, somewhere higher on the vestment. Then I would have had to turn it all the right side out again. But I don't need to do it for this small piece here. It's the very bottom. So I get to repin that bottom section again and press it now that it's actually sewn. I had a video for the bursts and the chalice veil for this, but they they were on the camera. I made them before I moved, and my camera got broken in the move, and I haven't been able to get them off the camera. The bursts pretty much you don't need because I have other videos on how to do the bursts. Um, the chalice veil is done pretty much the same way as the chasuble. I cut the lining you can do it th this way, just um, right sides together, turn inside out, or you can do it the way the chasuble was done, which is cut the lining a little larger, fold it over to the top, uh, use steam a seam or stitch witchery to put it down, and then cover the raw edge with trim. And that's what I did on this particular one because I wanted the trim around it. I had put the trim around it on the bursts, so I wanted the trim around the chalice veil. But I didn't want the trim around the maniple and the stole. So this just needs to have the ends finished. And the the ends the finishing of the ends is just um fringe. And I'll show you how to do that after I've finished um, with the maniple. I still have to open the seams on the maniple.
If you ever have any questions about what I've done or what I'm doing in a video or what you see me doing in a video and you, um, you have questions, uh, I do answer the comments, though I don't get around to it as fast as I'm sure people would appreciate. If you need an answer, just email me. Um, if you're a member, if you're a subscriber, and I don't mean a subscriber to YouTube, but a subscriber to my website, um, you'll have the e you'll you will have the email address, which is ihmdaughters at yahoo.com. I don't mind answering questions. Can you just take an iron and iron this down flat without pushing the edges out like this? No, not really. You could try it. I've never been successful with that. Now we're ready for fringe. What I was doing here was just trying to get both of them so they're both even to see how much at the bottom I have if I have the same amount. And I did. It's about two inches on the bottom. It's actually three inches on the stole, two and a half, three inches. So I want, um, there's two inches on the bottom and I'm going to turn up a half an inch of that. So I, with the ruler, I'm marking the half inch that I'm going to turn up. And decided I'm on this, on the other, on the other side, because there's a fractionally little bit longer on the other side. I'm just going to measure the one and a half inches down from the applique and draw the line. It comes up to about a scant like eighth of an inch more than a half an inch. I'm cutting off the excess lining. And now that I have a chalk line at the bottom to work with, I'm going to, what I'm looking for is steam the seam. And I ended up opening a new a new roll but I I would have done better using the stitch which is what and that's what I use when I did go to do the stole because the steam seam this new roll um, 
there was something there was something wrong with it. It seemed like the glue was on the wrong side of the paper. So what I'm doing now is just turning in the fold that half an inch and I'm going to press it flat and then I'll put the steam seam inside to glue them to glue it in place until I get the the fringe down. When I sew the fringe across, it will actually sew the whole bottom closed. It's easier to turn it if you get the ends and then go back and do the middle. At the ends, you're dealing with twice as much fabric. I cut a piece of steam seam and stuck it in there, but it turned out it was there was no glue on it. It was just paper, and I couldn't get it to stick, and then I realized it was just paper. All the glue stuck to the other side of the paper. At this point, I still haven't realized what the problem is, and now I do. Now, if I had been smart, I would have just put a piece of stitch witchery, which is laying right there next to the steam seam, into that little pocket and pressed it. It would have been so easy. Instead of trying to do this with the steam seam and then pull the paper off. because the paper was giving me no end of trouble there was some the roll had been damaged in some way i don't and the glue didn't want to stay down
Again, I'm doing the ends. First. And then I can go back and do the middle. Again, steam -a seam is tacky, and so it sticks where you want. It'll stay where you put it, and because of the paper, you can iron on top of it to get it, to glue it in exactly the spot you want it. So it has some advantages, but here again, it would have been a lot easier just to put the stitch witchery in that pocket. Now I'm going to put fringe down, and so I'm going to go get the fringe. Now, the fringe has little bumps where there's two tassels for each bump, as what I'm showing you. And you want to put three bumps outside. You're going to start measuring three bumps outside the edge of the maniple one on both sides. So I lay it down beside where the three are then find the three on the other side and then cut it there. You want to cut it between two of the bumps. If you cut it through the center of a bump, you'll actually lose both of those pieces of fringe. And do the same with the other three, three bumps on both sides. And 
and then you put the steam a seam down from one edge to the other right about where you want the head of the the fringe to be the, the header on the fringe is the sewn part at the top And then you're going to take the paper off it and put a little bit back on. Okay, get the paper started. And this glue really likes sticking to the velvet. So I had to kind of sometimes with my fingernail hold the glue down so it wouldn't pull up with the paper. It's actually scraping it off the paper almost with my finger, fingernail. All right. Then I'm going to take a, about a quarter of an inch of that paper and put it back down on each edge, each end. So that when I put the fringe down, it won't stick in those spots because I'm going to want to turn the fringe at the ends. So I put about a quarter of an inch back down on top of the glue. The glue is tacky. It'll hold it. And then I'll take it up on the other side and do the same thing. Peel all the paper off and put back a quarter of an inch on each end. Does it have to be exactly a quarter of an inch? No. Now you're going to put your fringe down again, keeping three bumps outside and then and sticking the the header to the sticky part of the stitch witchery and then hit it with the iron to glue it in place. Now it's not glued at the ends because of the paper. So you can bend the, the ends of the, the fringe back, take that paper off, fold those three bumps underneath, and push them down with your finger and hit them with the iron. And do the same with the other side. Paper off, fold it under your three bumps, hit it with an iron. Now once I get this down, I'm going to put some pins in it. The pins are not to hold the fringe down. The, the pins are like a string around your finger. It's to remind me how to sew this. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean in a minute. If I don't put a pin in there, I'm going to just want to start, uh, put the fringe underneath the, the feed dogs and sew across. And if I do that, I'm going to get a gap at the end of the, of the, where I started. 
you want to start about a quarter of an inch down where and so backwards and then all the way across you always sew backwards and then across if you start to sew all the way across it's going to roll that first edge and you'll have a gap you need to back up now this the maniple also needs a piece of elastic to, to keep it on his arm um, I use gold elastic you can use white elastic the alba is white so you, it'll, it'll blend in enough um, need about eight inches I think this piece is actually seven doesn't matter it needs to be at least six inches but so yep mine is seven inches long and that's fine now you need to find the middle and put a mark there exactly where the middle of the the maniple is you know where that is because that's where the cross is and then you want to go about three inches not more than three and a half on each side and I'm doing three and a half so I put the and then you put the elastic where you put your pin your three and a half point and you want it facing the long part facing away from the center and then you're going to pull it to the other side and where the other pin is and about a, you need about a half an inch um, you put the pin at about the half inch from in from the edge so you about a half an inch in from the edge you line it up with the pin that you put in there and you're just going to sew backwards and forwards across the end down back and down again and that will take care of your maniple the stole also needs fringe and i'm going to do that now this will come out a lot faster than the maniple did because i just at this point realized i should be using stitch witchery so i measured this and it was a little bit longer than the um it's actually two and a half i think the other one was two inches and this is actually two and a half i think uh, but i'm still taking a half of an inch off the bottom so this is the other one what from the bottom of the design to the bottom of the stole was one and a half this is going to be two inches so i marked it and i turn then you turn it again i turn the ends in And then and then go back and do the middle still is a little wider than the maniple not much but a little bit It seems to be a little bit easier to turn than the maniple because it's a little wider.
For once it's good and pressed, you can take the pins out. Yeah, I decided to use stitch witchery. I pressed it from the back only because the velvet's thicker and it gets more steam if I do it from the back. So I press it from the front and then I flipped it over. I did the same with the maniple and press it on the back just to make sure that it's glued. It won't matter in a few minutes when I sew the fringe down. It, this fringe will hold the whole end closed. But until that point, it's like basting. And instead of basting it closed, I'm just going to use stitch witchery. Now the stole also is going to need fringe. Do you, do you have to put fringe? No. How long should be the fringe? I was using two inch, but I've used three inch. I've used four inch. I've used some really elaborate fringes that get even a little longer than that because they have big headers. Um, but you don't need any fringe at all. It's The vestment is however you want it to be or however the priest you're working for wants it to be. This, this stole would look just fine without any fringe on it. In which case I would just sew across the bottom of the, the stole and the maniple. But fringe adds some weight to it. Actual weight as well as visual weight. And so I almost always put fringe. Again, three bumps in from the edge. Same with the other side, three bumps, three bumps. I don't know how else to describe them except that they're bumps. When you look at it, you'll see what I'm talking about. I had thought to put, put, bring the fringe up to the camera so you could see, but it would be out of focus. So just take my word for it. It's, they're bumps. Now there are different kinds of fringe, but most of them all work pretty much the same way. There's a brush fringe. This is chain, chainette. Um, and then I've used brush fringe. I've used the chainette. There's a bullion fringe. A lot of your really old vestments with have a metallic bullion um, fringe to them. All right, you pull the paper off and you put the paper down on both ends, about a quarter of an inch. Then put your fringe down in place. I have tried lots of ways to put fringe down. I found this to be the most effective method. Um, taking 
taking the uh, using the steam of seam and putting the paper back down before there was steam of seam and I was using stitch witchery I would just stop a little before the ends and then come after I folded it back I would put a little piece of steam um, stitch witchery under the ends but the paper on the steam seam makes it easy to do this without having to worry about that. Because it won't grab where the paper is. Sometimes it moves and you think, oh no, it's shifted on me. It's just shifted because there was no pa because of the paper. Once you take the paper out and glue it down, it'll be straight. And then I put the pins in to remind me. I, why do I put it on both sides? Just because I never know which end I'm going to be bringing, which side of it I'll be bringing to the, the foot. And that way I got it. I have a pin on both ends that I, I will remember. The stitch witchery or steam seam is so is holding everything down. You really you don't need the pins for that reason. The pins are just there to remind me I have to come in this quarter of an inch and go backwards. And then go forwards. such a little thing but it makes a big difference just like sewing from the neck down in both directions and once they're sewn that'll be it um, as I say I lost the video or can't at this point put it up on YouTube for the the uh, chalice veil but I am going to show you the chalice veil so that you can see what I did with it Again, it's I, it has the trim around the edge. So I just cut the, the lining uh, about an inch wider, half an inch to an inch wider. Uh, used steam a seam along the edges. Then folded the, the lining over, uh, ironed it down, and then used stitch witchery with the trim to put the trim down on top of the raw edge all the way around and then sewed it all the way around and it makes a nice looking veil.